Dr. Sage here. In today's video, we begin our discussion about microbial nutrition and growth. In particular, we're gonna focus on microbial nutrition in this video. By the end of this video, you should be able to list the essential nutrients of a bacterial cell, differentiate between macronutrients and micronutrients, list and define four different terms that describe an organism's sources of carbon and energy, define spoprobe and parasite, and describe why these terms can be an oversimplification. In microbial nutrition, nutrients are acquired from the environment and used for cellular activities. An essential nutrient is any substance, whether in elemental or molecular form, that must be provided to an organism. Macronutrients are required in relatively large quantities and play principal roles in cell structure and metabolism. Micronutrients, also called trace elements, are present in much smaller amounts and they're involved in enzyme function and maintenance of protein structure. Inorganic nutrients are atoms or simple molecules that contain a combination of atoms other than carbon or hydrogen. For example, carbon dioxide would be an inorganic nutrient. Organic nutrients contain carbon and hydrogen atoms, and they're usually the product of living things. For example, glucose would be an organic nutrient. So, the microorganisms, where do they get their inorganic reservoirs of elements? I'm not going to read you this whole list, but some representative examples. Carbon often comes from carbon dioxide in the air. Oxygen comes from oxygen gas in the air. Nitrogen can come from nitrogen gas in the air. Hydrogen can come from water. While phosphorus, sulfur, and potassium can be found in mineral deposits. So, as a representative bacterial cell, if we look at an E. coli cell and break down its chemical composition, about 70% of its total weight is water. Now, if we ignore water and only look at the dry weight of the cell, half of the dry weight of the cell is made up of proteins, 20% is RNA, 3% is DNA, 10% is carbohydrates, 10% is lipids, and 4% is miscellaneous. If we break it down even further, again looking at the dry weight of the cell, Carbon atoms make up 50% of the dry weight, oxygen 20, nitrogen 14, hydrogen 8, phosphorus 3, and sulfur 1. For microbes, the essential nutrients are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur, and it's often represented by the abbreviation CHOMPS, C-H-O-N-P-S. So where do organisms get their source of carbon? Okay, well, there are different types of organisms. One type of organism is called a heterotroph. A heterotroph is an organism that must obtain its carbon in organic form. Because of this, it's dependent upon other life forms. Most carbon sources exist in a form that is simple enough for absorption, but larger molecules must be digested by the cell before absorption. Alternatively, we can have an autotroph. Autotrophs are called cell feeders. These are organisms that use inorganic carbon dioxide as its carbon source having the capacity to convert carbon dioxide into carbon compounds. Therefore, it's not nutritionally dependent upon other living things. So, if we compare organisms that you're more familiar with, humans would be a heterotroph, whereas plants would be an autotroph. Plants get their carbon from the carbon dioxide in the air, whereas we get our carbon from the food we eat, for example, from glucose. All right, well, where do organisms get their nitrogen? Well, the main reservoir is nitrogen gas, N2, which makes up 79% of the atmosphere. Nitrogen is indispensable to structure of proteins, DNA, RNA, and ATP. And these are the primary nitrogen sources for the heterotrophs. They must be degraded into basic building blocks in order to be utilized. For example, a heterotroph will ingest the protein, break it down to amino acids to get the nitrogen. Some bacteria and algae utilize inorganic nitrogen sources. Regardless of the source, nitrogen must be converted to NH3 before it enters the cell. This is the only form that can be directly combined with carbon to synthesize amino acids and other compounds. Oxygen plays an important role in the structural and enzymatic functions of the cell. Oxygen is a major component of carbohydrates, lipids, nucleic acids, and proteins. It's a common component of inorganic salts, and oxygen gas makes up 20% of the Earth's atmosphere. Hydrogen serves critical roles in the biochemistry of cells. For example, it helps to maintain a pH, forming hydrogen bonds between molecules, and it serves as a source of free energy in oxidation reduction reactions of cellular respiration. The main inorganic source of phosphorus is phosphate, 
which can be derived from phosphoric acid, and it's found in rocks and ocean mineral deposits. Phosphorus is a key component of nucleic acids, so it's essential to the genetics of cells and viruses. It's also found in ATP, which is the important energy molecule in cells. Sulfur is widely distributed throughout the environment in rocks and sediments. Sulfur is an essential component of some vitamins, for example, vitamin B1, and amino acids methionine and cysteine. And the sulfur in these amino acids help to form disulfide bonds that can help determine the shape and structural stability of proteins. A growth factor is an organic compound such as an amino acid, nitrogen containing base, or vitamin that cannot be synthesized by an organism. For example, the essential amino acids. Since the organism can't synthesize it, but it's required for life, they must be provided by the environment for the organism. So we can break down the different organisms based on how they get their source of energy and their source of carbon. Phototrophs are microbes that use photosynthesis to get their energy, whereas chemotrophs are microbes that gain energy from chemical compounds. A heterotroph is an organism that must obtain its carbon in organic form, whereas an autotroph is an organism that uses inorganic carbon dioxide as its carbon source. So let's break that down a little bit more. Okay, so you can combine the autotroph and the heterotroph with a phototroph and the chemotroph. For example, we can have a photoautotroph. The photo refers to where it gets its source of energy, in this case from sunlight. Autotroph refers to where it gets its source of carbon, in this case from inorganic compounds like carbon dioxide. Examples of organisms that are photoautotrophs are photosynthetic organisms, such as algae, plants, and cyanobacteria. Now, we can also have a photoheterotroph. Photo, again, refers to where it gets its energy. That's sunlight again. But now heterotroph, where it gets its carbon, is from organic compounds. Examples of these would be purple and green photosynthetic bacteria. Then we can have the autotrophs. First, the chemoautotroph. Chemo is referring to where it gets a source of energy, in this case from chemicals. Autotroph, where it gets its source of carbon, in this case from inorganic compounds. Now we can further break this down into a chemoorganic autotroph. In that case, it gets its source of energy from organic compounds, and it gets its carbon source from, again, inorganic compounds. An example of that are methanogens. Or we can have a chemolitho autotroph. Okay. Chemolitho, it gets its energy from inorganic compounds, minerals, and it gets its source of carbon, again, from inorganic compounds. An example of this would be thiobacillus, which is called the rock-eating bacteria. Finally, we can have the chemoheterotrophs. Chemo gets a source of energy from chemicals. Heterotrophs gets a source of carbon from organic compounds. Now, we can further break this down into saprobes and parasites. So probes metabolize the organic matter of dead organisms to get their source of energy and get, they get their carbon from organic compounds. Examples of this are fungi and the bacteria that are decomposers. Then we can have the parasites. They get their source of energy utilizing the tissues and fluids of a live host and they get the source of carbon again from organic compounds. Examples of this are various parasites and pathogens. They can be bacteria, fungi, protozoa, or animals. We have the photoautotrophs, which capture energy from light rays and transform it into chemical energy that can be used for cell metabolism. They produce organic molecules that can be used by themselves and by heterotrophs, and they form the basis of most food webs. Then we have the chemoautotrophs, which can be broken down into chemoorganic autotrophs and chemolithoautotrophs. Chemoorganic autotrophs use organic compounds for energy and inorganic compounds as a carbon source, whereas the chemolithoautotrophs require neither sunlight nor organic nutrients and rely entirely on inorganic materials. Methanogens are chemoorganic autotrophs that produce methane from hydrogen gas and carbon dioxide. They're formed in anaerobic, hydrogen-containing microenvironments of soil, swamps, mud, or the intestines of some animals. They're archaea, some of which live in extreme habitats, such as ocean vents and hot springs, which get up to 400 degrees Celsius. And methane can be used as a fuel and plays a role as a greenhouse gas. Then we have the chemoheterotrophs, which is the majority of heterotrophic microorganisms. They derive both carbon and energy from organic compounds. Organic molecules processed through respiration or fermentation 
release energy in the form of ATP. So aerobic cellular respiration is the principal energy yielding pathway in animals, protozoa, fungi, and aerobic bacteria. This is complementary to photosynthesis. Glucose and oxygen are reactants, and carbon dioxide is given off. The Earth's balance of energy and metabolic gases is dependent upon this reaction. In a future set of video lectures, we're gonna go through the details of aerobic cellular respiration and fermentation. Then we have the saprobic microorganisms. These are decomposers of plant litter, animal matter, and dead microbes. They are very important in recycling nutrients held in organic materials. Most saprobes have a rigid cell wall and cannot engulf large particles of food. They are bacteria and fungi. So since they can't engulf their food, instead they release enzymes into the environment to digest the food into smaller particles that can then be transported into the cell. Then we have parasitic microorganisms. They live on or in the body and cause some degree of harm to the host. They're considered pathogens because they can damage tissues and cause death. Obligate parasites are unable to grow outside of living host. Obligate intercellular parasites spend all or part of their life cycle inside a host cell. So that was an overview of microbial nutrition. Until next time, this has been Dr. Sage.